Hi, this is Dane Quinn from the University of Akron, and today I will do an example on particle dynamics. We have two blocks of mass M1 and M2, not necessarily the same, that are connected by a massless link and slide down a rough surface inclined at an angle of phi. So the coefficient of friction between each block and the surface is given as mu1 between m1 and the surface, and then mu2 between m2 and the surface. Again, the blocks are not necessarily the same. They could be different materials. They could have different surface roughnesses. So they have different coefficients of friction as well. I'd like to find the acceleration of the pair, assuming that they slide down the plane, and the tension in the rod during that case. Then finally, I'd like to know the minimum angle, and I'll call that phi star, so that the blocks slide down the plane when released from rest. If the angle was too shallow, the blocks would just remain stationary, and as the angle is increased, at some point there becomes a critical angle, again phi star, at which they start to slide down the plane. So I'd like to identify that value of phi. So let's begin and look at the problem. Here we have two objects and it's a single degree of freedom system, so we only need one coordinate to describe the motion. And I will identify the forces that act on each of these blocks. So we have the weight acting on both blocks. And we'll identify that as W1 and W2. So again, identifying the forces. We have weight. Next, we will consider the normal forces that act between each block and the surface. So those will be here, and we'll identify them as N1 and N2. Then we have friction acting again between the surface and each block. And that force will be tangent to the surface, like so. And we'll identify these values as F1 and F2. Finally, we have the tension in the rod. So if I take the rod and cut it here in the center, I can consider the interaction from block 1 to block 2 and vice versa through the tension that's developed in the rod. Again, this tension is really what connects these two objects together. Because this is an internal force, the tensions must have equal magnitude and opposite direction. So if the tension acting on block 1 is defined as T, then acting on block 2 we have minus T. Again, these two forces have to balance one another out equal magnitude, but opposite direction. So here we have the forces that act on the two objects. We have T is the tension, the friction is given as F, the normal loads are defined by N, and then W represents the weight. Notice that we haven't said what these forces are, we haven't gone and for example said that W1 is you know, minus Mg in some direction. Instead, at this point, we're simply trying to identify what forces are present so that now I can turn to coordinates and directions. The motion here is along the plane. So it makes sense to identify directions along the plane and normal to the plane, as well as directions I and J that are going to be horizontal and vertical fixed in the ground. So these directions that are along the plane and normal to the plane, I will define as E1 and E2. Then E1 is inclined by an angle of phi relative to the horizontal direction. So with these, we can relate I and J and E1 and E2. In particular, I is seen to be cosine of phi in the E1 direction minus sine of phi in the E2 direction, while J is sine of phi 
in the E1 direction plus cosine of phi in the E2 direction. I can also go through and define E1 and E2 in terms of i and j in a similar fashion. So now, what coordinates to measure? Well, coordinates are measurable quantities that help specify the configuration of the system. Here, the configuration of the system implies knowing where the blocks are at. And since the motion of this system is along the plane, let's measure a coordinate that describes the displacement along the plane. So here, we'll define some origin and we'll represent the displacement of the blocks up the plane as x. So with this, we can now talk about the kinematics, and in particular, the acceleration. In terms of the measured coordinates that we have, the acceleration of block 1 is equal to the acceleration of block 2. Again, these things are constrained to move together. So those are given as x double dot in the e1 direction. I don't know what this value is, but if I knew x double dot, then I can determine the acceleration. Again, when we talk about kinematics, we're trying to describe the acceleration of the objects in terms of the measured quantities. I don't necessarily know what those measured quantities are at this point, and in fact that's one of the things that I'm solving for, but now we have the acceleration written in terms of the variables. So turning to the forces, we can finally describe each of these forces in terms of the directions and known and unknown quantities. So if I look at the weight first, the weight on block 1 is minus m1 g in the j direction. For block 2, m2 g in the j direction. For the normal loads, I know the direction. They're in the E2 direction or perpendicular to the surface. However, I don't know the magnitudes. So I'll assume that the normal load acting on block 1 is N1, an unknown quantity, in the E2 direction. And for block 2, I have N2 in the E2 direction. Likewise for the friction forces. At this point, I haven't said anything at all about stick or slip or the kinematics. So I don't know the magnitude of the force, but I do know that it's in the E1 direction. So for block 1, I have F1, E1, and block 2, I have F2, E1. Later on in the problem statement, I will have to determine if the friction force corresponds to a case of sticking or a case of slipping, but for now, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that till later. Finally, the tension. Again, these two forces have equal magnitude in opposite direction. The magnitude, however, is unknown, but the direction is E1. So this force I'll call T in the E1 direction, which means that this force is minus T in the E1 direction. So here we have all the forces labeled. We know the acceleration of block 1 and block 2. They're identical, x double dot, in the E1 direction. So I'm ready to apply the equations of motion. In particular, we want to apply linear momentum balance, or sum of the forces is mass times acceleration. Notice that we have two objects, right? I have block one and block two that I'm considering as separate things. So each object gets an application of linear momentum balance. So for block one, we have sum of the forces acting on block 1 is the mass of block 1 times the acceleration of block 1. And all I have to do is take the forces that I've already defined and the acceleration that I've already identified in terms of the coordinates and finish this up. So here the forces are Let's go back and look. I have the weight, the tension, the friction, and the normal load. So we have the weight, minus m1, g, in the j direction. The tension, t, in the e1 direction. The friction force, f1, in the e1 direction. And the normal load, n1, 
in the E2 direction. And so that's going to be equal to m1 times the acceleration. Let's remind ourselves, acceleration we identified as x double dot in the E1 direction. So this is linear momentum balance applied to block 1. It's a vector equation. It has components in two directions. Then we turn to block 2. And we do the same thing. Some of the forces acting on block 2 is m2, that's the mass of block 2, times the acceleration of block 2. And the forces here are given in our free body diagram. Once again, we have the weight, minus m2g in the j direction. The tension on block 2 now is minus t in the e1 direction. Remember, these are of equal magnitude in opposite direction. Finally, the friction force and the normal force. Finally, on the right-hand side, m2 is the mass of block 2, and the acceleration of block 2 is x double dot in the e2 direction. And we have a vector equation describing linear momentum balance as applied to block 2. So now, as with any vector equation, I want to take components. Now, I could take components in i and j, or I can take components in e1 and e2. It makes more sense in this case to take components in the e1 and e2 directions for a couple of different reasons. One reason is that there are more terms in the E1 and E2 directions, so I just don't have to do as much work. Right? All I have to do is transform the weight into these two directions, but that's not really the best reason. Really the best reason is that if I look at the unknowns, the unknowns, I don't know the tension, I haven't said what the friction force is yet, I don't know the normal loads, and I don't know x double dot. And all of these unknowns are nicely split in the E1 and E2 direction. Like I said, some of these are in the E1 only, some of these are in the E2 only directions. So it makes more sense to choose components that split up the unknowns in sort of the simplest way possible. And again, in this case, it's components in the E1 and E2 direction. So in order to do that, I need to write j in terms of e1 and e2. But I've already done that. When I define these directions on the previous slide, I have j is equal to sine phi e1 and cosine phi e2. So let's just remind ourselves what that is. Sine phi e1 plus cosine phi e2. So I'll take this direction, I'll substitute it in to the weight, and I'll take components in both the e1 and e2 directions. So looking at block 1, we can take components in the e1 direction and find that our first term is minus m1g sine of phi, and again that's the e1 component from the weight, plus t plus f1 equals m1x double dot. And now in the e2 direction we have a term due to the weight, so that becomes minus m1g cosine of phi plus m1 equals 0. For block 2, we apply a similar procedure so that in the E1 direction we find minus m2 g sine of phi minus t plus f2 equals m2 x double dot and in the E2 direction we find minus m2 g cosine of phi plus n2 equals 0. So here we have linear momentum balance applied to block 1 and block 2 taken in the e1 
and the E2 directions. If I look at this, I have four equations here. And let's identify the unknowns. Right, so these are the things that we must solve for. Well, I don't know the tension, T. I don't know F1. I don't know X double dot. I don't know N1. And then I don't know F2. And I don't know N2. So really, I have six unknowns and four equations. So we need two additional equations. And those two additional equations will come from our definition of friction. So if the system is slipping down the plane, we actually know what these two forces are. While if the block is sticking, right, then we have a constraint on the motion. So ultimately, we'll have enough equations to solve for the requested unknowns, the acceleration of the pair when they're slipping, and the tension in the rod. Now we need to solve these equations. And if I look, I'm going to eliminate T from these two equations and solve for N1 and N2 directly. So again, we'll eliminate T and solve for N1 and N2. In particular, N1 is simply M1 G cosine. And N2 is equal to M2 G cosine. Then, and this is, there's a little bit of algebra in, in this next step, which I'm, I'm not going to show on the video solution, but I would encourage you maybe to pause this, take this first equation here, solve for T, substitute it into this second equation at this point, and what you will find is that M1 plus M2 times X double dot equals minus M1 plus M2 G sine of phi plus F1 plus F2. Again, there was a little bit of work in algebra involved in getting this step, but it's not so bad. And we can go back and solve for the tension. I'll take this expression and reintroduce it back into, say, here, and I can solve for the tension, but now in terms of x double dot. So when we do that, we find that t is equal to m1 x double dot minus f plus m1 g sine of phi, or using this equation for x double dot, we find that the tension can be reduced to m1 times f2 minus m2 f1 divided by m1 plus m2. So now I need to specify these friction forces. Now the problem statement said that the block was slipping down the plane. So in that case, x dot is negative. Because, if I go back and look at the definition of x, x was measured as the displacement up the plane. So if x is increasing, or x dot is positive, these blocks are moving up the plane, while if x is decreasing, x dot is negative, and the blocks are moving down the plane. So when the blocks slip down the plane, we find that the friction force, F1, is mu1 n1, which is equal to mu1 m1 g cosine of phi, and f2 is mu2 n2, which reduces to mu2 m2 g cosine of phi. And now I can actually go and solve for the tension. So taking these expressions for F1 and F2, introducing them here, the tension becomes 
mu2 minus mu1 times m1 m2 g cosine of phi divided by the total mass m1 plus m2. So again, this is the tension in that massless link when the blocks are slipping down the plane. Notice that if the coefficients of friction are identical, so that mu1 is equal to mu2, then no tension is developed. Essentially, what happens is these blocks just slide down almost as if they were independent of one another. They slide down with the same acceleration, so there's no tension that's developed. It's only when the coefficients of friction differ that we end up developing a tension in the rod. Now, we can also use this to find the acceleration. Doing so, we end up solving for x double dot as minus g sine of phi. Right? So actually, we'll divide through by m1 plus m2 here. And we just get minus g sine of phi plus a term that looks like mu1 m1 plus mu2 m2 g cosine of phi divided by m1 plus m2. So this allows us to solve for the acceleration of block 1 again equal to the acceleration of block 2 as x double dot in the e1 direction where x double dot is given by this expression. So notice that if there's no friction x double dot is negative always minus g sine of phi. With friction we again have the possibility of slip or stick and so if it is slipping then this is the acceleration. However when the blocks stick, then x double dot is equal to zero. And the friction force, and we'll say f sub i, where i is one or two, is less than mu i n i. So f1 is less than or equal to mu1 n1. F2 is less than or equal to mu2 n2. At the critical angle, So that's phi equal phi star. Both of these conditions hold. X double dot is equal to zero. And the friction forces have to be equal to mu n. Right? So at this critical value, F1 is mu1 n1. F2 is equal to mu2 n2. And X double dot is equal to zero. So we'll go back up to this original expression here, put in x double dot equal to zero, f1 and f2 are given here, and that will allow us to solve for the critical angle. So the equation becomes zero is minus m1 plus m2 g sine of phi star plus now mu1 m1 plus mu2 m2 g cosine of phi star or solving for phi star we find that the tangent of phi star has to be equal to mu1 m1 plus mu2 m2 divided by m1 plus m2 so again, this allows us to determine the value of phi star. Notice that we could also obtain this expression from the acceleration when it's slipping down the plane and the limit that x double dot becomes zero. That equation is the same as what we obtained here. Right? So we can either look at the case where it's sticking so that x double dot is zero and let the friction forces go to their upper limit. Or we can look at the acceleration when it's slipping and let that value go to zero to identify the critical angle. So that's it. We have found the acceleration. Let's maybe put that in blue. 
and we have also found the critical angle as well as the tension when the blocks are sliding. So this was a nice example. We had two objects. Each of them had friction. There was a constraint between the two objects. We had internal forces. We had normal friction, gravity. There's a lot of things going on in this problem. Even though at first glance it might seem like a fairly simple problem of just you know an object sliding down a plane. So that's it for this example. Thank you and I will be back.